Hmm. I'm not getting a response from the mouse. Try. Okay. okay. Um, so, okay, again to the uh, global land and ocean temperature map from the 1880s to uh, 2022, you can see that the temperature has been increasing and the, by far the hottest years have been in the last decade or so. Last summer was a very warm summer globally. And uh, it was the hottest summer on record by uh, four tenths of a degree Fahrenheit, which globally is a lot. And so that's where the star is up there. Um, and it's, I put a question mark next to it because it was just the summer temperature. It wasn't the average annual temperature for the whole year. But um, there are a lot of feedback loops that make things get warmer faster. One of the main ones is the ice caps um, reflect light very well. And as ice retreats, uh, light is not reflected back into the atmosphere as efficiently or as, as much. And there are a number of other things at, like when um, polar tundra thaws, it tends to release methane, which is a very potent greenhouse gas. And so unfortunately, most of the feedback loops are positive feedback loops, meaning they make the process go more. Um, so um, anyway, things are getting warmer at um, what I would call an alarming rate. Um, is this another discussion of methane? compared to the carbon dioxide? Um, methane is emitted through industrial processes. And so it's basically the same thing. It, there's a lot less methane going into the air, but it's about 20 times more potent as a greenhouse gas. So for the purposes of what we're talking about today, uh, you could consider carbon in the atmosphere as carbon in the atmosphere. Okay. But you can, you can go very deep on all that atmospheric chemistry, um, which I, you, I can't. <laughs> but, um, it's it's it can get complicated when you when you dig into that. That's actually it's not that complicated. Well, methane methane and greenhouse ag 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 agriculture isn't it the, the, the like cattle and cow burps. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, it's actually cow burps. It's not even cow farts. It's cow burps. <laughs> and um, yeah, that's that's a big one for sure. And then a, a huge one is um, leakage from uh, fossil fuel extraction. Uh -huh. A lot of times you'll see a refinery or even out in a oil field, mm -hmm. there'll be a big flame where they're burning off the methane. But if there isn't a flame like that, it might just be going straight up into the sky without being burned, which is keeps it as methane, which is more of a problem. If it's burned, it flows more towards carbon dioxide. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Um, okay, I, I want to get into storms and how they're affecting us locally. And so just how does heat affect weather? The, the planet is warming up. Basically, hot air rises, and when the surface of the land or the surface of the ocean is warm, storm it, the, the air rises more quickly, um, more violently in some cases, like a hurricane. Um, and you know, a bad hurricane season is coming when the ocean is warm in the areas where hurricanes are generated. Um, when hurricanes move north, they move into colder water, and they lose that fuel, they lose that heat that lifts the air up in the middle and drives the system. And so more heat means more rain and more wind. And so the um, what that drives then, a few minutes, um, are um, storms. And then one of the bigger, well, not a bigger problem, a another thing that affects this is that as the poles warm, the jet stream gets wavier. So um, the, the diagram on the left shows a jet stream that's moving through pretty quickly. The diagram on the right shows a wavy wet uh, jet stream. And if the jet stream's going up and down like that, it's not traveling from west to east very fast. So when storms come along, they move slowly and they tend to camp out over places and drop a lot more rain than they would if they moved through quickly. And the same is true with dry weather. Um, you know, from about 2006 to last year, basically, the high pressure over the Eastern Pacific, over us, camped out for, you know, incredibly long times and, and blocked the rain. So this is just another thing that's happening in the atmosphere that's making storms uh, more damaging. Is that different for the Southern Hemisphere? 
I mean, that um, picture was... You know, that's interesting. I, I don't know the answer to that. And the reason I don't know the answer to that is that Antarctica as a continent is different from the polar ocean the, on the North Pole. Um, I would I would hazard to say it's going to be similar, but I don't really know the answer yeah. to that. The jet stream in what was on the image? Yeah. Well, there's no other one. No, there. there's yeah, there, there's a kind of a mirror circulation in the oh, southern okay. hemisphere. Yeah. Yeah. So this is a side, a little a little side note, because um, I think it's important for us to know how we know what we know. And in climate change, there's a lot of discussion about um, whether the data are good, whether they're being interpreted correctly, et cetera. And the, um, the IPCC, uh, the International Climate Scientific Organization, has done a lot of work with a lot of data to identify uncertainty. How certain are they of certain conclusions? Um, but I just want to point out, and this is talking to a library group, this is epistemology. This is something you guys are all good at, how, how we know what we know, how you do research and know when you've got the right answer. Um, but you just think of some of these fields that depend entirely on getting good data and analyzing it correctly. Um, and journalism used to be that way, and in some cases it still is, but things go bad if you start getting sloppy with data or using things that are not accurately measured or measured at all. So um, I, I can't, we, we don't have enough time to get into it, but um, get into this discussion. But for all the data I'm showing, I've tried to cite the sources at the bottom of the graph and they're all based on a lot of data by well-respected institutions. Okay, so now I want to get into local hazards. And this is a model diagram from windy.com, which is one of my favorite weather websites. And this was on uh, Wednesday the 27th of December, a couple weeks ago. And so this is an intense storm. That L in the middle is low pressure. And the reading there at 971 millibars is equivalent to a hurricane storm. At, and that means the air is rising so fast that there's low pressure at the surface because it's sucking it away like a vacuum. So that generated a very large fetch. And in the Northern Hemisphere, winds go around a low pressure in a counterclockwise way. And you can see from the purple color that there was a long fetch, a very strong wind pointed basically right at us where the star is. And so this is an example of a slow moving, powerful storm generating high uh, sea surface waves. And this is a, a model from windy.com also that just shows the intensity of the waves being generated um, towards, towards us. And then this is a day later at Rio del Mar. Yep. So um, it's, I, you know, it's important to kind of tie all these things together. This is, you know, we've had big waves here for as long as people have lived here. The difference is that uh, people are inhabiting hazardous places. Mm -hmm. And also that these events tend to happen more often than they used to. Um, That's because of the ocean level, right? I mean, um, a lot. It's mostly because of the heat in the, in the ocean. It's just generating yeah, more I mean, energy. I mean, for, I'll get to sea level rise in a second. Yeah, That's a little okay, bit different. Yeah. But more about the intensity of the waves. More about the intensity of storms. Yeah. yeah. The direction they're coming from. Right. Okay. Yeah. That too. Um, so this is an interesting thing that I want to spend a, a couple minutes on because I'm a little bit of a local policy wonk. And this is this is kind of a classic. Um, so this is out at New Brighton. I actually went out there yesterday and took these photographs. Um, but it shows stilting. Houses built up on stilts. And the house in the upper left has a sacrificial first floor. You can see there's plywood there. And so this is an example of armoring, trying to protect a place where the ocean would normally otherwise go. Um, what the California Coastal Commission wants to do um, is a move away from this because armoring has uh, it's it, kind of in the long term, it's ineffectual, and in the short term, it changes the beach dynamics uh, that can shift the hazard to somewhere else. What do you mean, the stones? Yes, that's right. This all those big riprap stones to protect the houses. 
So the alternative is managed retreat. And this is still well hauled out at Fort Ord. I think this was in the 80s or 90s. But the ocean there undercut the, the cliff, which is basically made out of sand. Um, we're basically standing atop sand here as well. Um, but they removed Stillwell Hall to let the cliff move backwards. And um, so I want to read you something here, which is where the county of Santa Cruz finds itself in the argument about coastal armoring versus managed retreat. So um, I had an email exchange with a friend who's a planner in the county and who I know has been in the middle of this for a long time. And I just want to read some of the things he said because I think the details are very interesting. Mm -hmm. So the Coastal Commission has developed guidance for local jurisdictions on planning for sea level rise, including recommended policy approach with respect to coastal armoring. All local jurisdictions are expected to update their general plan slash co local coastal plan to be consistent with Coastal Commission guidance. Um, there has been controversy statewide and locally because the Coastal Commission policy is stricter than the county's historic practice in terms of allowing armoring to protect structures. So if you own one of those houses down on the beach, you're very much going to want the policy to go into the of coastal armoring. Um, and the county is probably more on the property owner's side of it. And the Coastal Commission is more on, this is something that is just going to keep happening. And the longer we armor, the further behind we're going to get in coming up with a real solution. So there's a conflict with property owners on one side, the Coastal Commission on the other, and the county in the middle. And um, so it says um, the conflicts between existing county policy and Coastal Commission guidance is playing out on individual projects, making the permit process for redevelopment of properties on coastal bluffs and beaches very complicated due to the Coastal Commission's appeal authority and the current tug of war between local and Coastal Commission policy approaches. In the coastal flood zones, beach and dunes, there are requirements, okay, so that, I, I got ahead of myself. So, so basically, I just think that's a fascinating thing and it's probably gonna play out in dozens of lawsuits to basically force the courts to come down on where on the spectrum they're going to allow arming and where they're going to require managed retreaters. The county just got their coastal uh, plan Planning. approved oh, okay. in December, and okay. so they actually had to go back to the Coastal Commission to get it. So I'm right. wondering what in their plan, if you've read it, I don't know. I have it. I, I've they looked at out, it, but it's been a while. They call out the case by case individual armory discussion between the two. Um, I know it, they just got it approved. They got denied. Right. So I'm under, I don't know. I thought maybe you would know. You don't yeah, know. I, I don't. I should actually, to tell you the truth, but I haven't read it in a couple of years, maybe before it got just denied got the first time. Okay. Is, um, is the consensus that the armory aggravates the? The, the action of the ocean? Yeah, I mean, it, it it increases the backwash, for one thing, and it tends to just move sand uh, more actively than if the sand were washing into a sand, or the white waves were washing into a sand dune. Okay. So it, it tends to shift the energy of the ocean to somewhere else down the road. There's a very, very, backyard, which, yeah. very recent example, I think, uh, looking at Aptos Springs, if they live along that. <laughs> yeah. So they armored one side. Just when uh, the storm did, right? So who they? Yeah. Right. <laughs> but that's the the, the side you got armored is creek side. The other side is blue side. Yeah. And if you think about the waves now coming in there, they're going to be wanting to go a little faster. Right. On the side and smooth and concrete, right? Yeah. The other side got obliterated. They lost two or three feet in their soil, yeah. and so moosehead's in danger now. Okay. So you're talking kind of up the creek. Yeah, and so now I can imagine you know half filled with toys or yeah, <laughs> each other yeah. The creek. But um, anyway, okay. I think it was just an obvious example of wow, where all the soil got when I look and I see all this new concrete. Yeah, yeah. Bonnie and then John. Yeah, I mean you were just talking about scientific information versus wealthy landowners and the counties wanting to keep them around. So 
they're not taking all the information that maybe the Coastal Commission could have with scientific information, it seems. You know, yeah, I mean, the, the interface between science and policy is and politics. Is move, moves and, and politics, sure. Yeah. I mean, imagine um, if the board lost pretty good. That's three it, billion dollars. Yeah, yeah. The, the boardwalk will come up a later as well. <laughs> John, John, are they are, is, is the county giving growing permits to new places on the beach? We're talking just if I think it's kind of easy to be now set. I don't know. Yeah, I, yeah, I don't know. But uh, so I'll read you a little bit more from this. It's just uh, three more sentences about stilting, which you can see here. In the coastal flood, flood zones, beach and dunes, there are requirements in the building code based on the FEMA National Flood Insurance Program. Basically, new and substantially improved houses in the coastal high hazard zone need to have the first floor elevated above the projected flood hazard water levels on the published FEMA maps. The results, this results in the houses on stilts you see on the beach. The lower area can be enclosed, but with breakaway walls. So sometimes an elevated house may appear to have a ground floor, but the area can only be used for parking and storage. And so that's what we see in the upper left there. It's a house that, that's got a sacrificial first floor there. Anyway, um, sorry about the little diversion into local policy, but I, I've always found this fascinating and I'm, it, it's still yet to play out where it's really gonna go. Um, all right, so um, that was a, a local hazard of storm uh, surge and waves. Um, so this is another local hazard, which is just strictly sea level rise. And obviously, the two reinforce each other and make it more dangerous. Um, so this is a map I made from NOAA's Digital Coast tool. Um, and it shows what would be flooded in Santa Cruz if sea level were to rise seven feet. Sea level is rising now at about a centimeter a year. So seven feet of sea level rise is a long way off. And they actually have a tool that will allow you to do the cumulative effects of sea level rise and storm surge, but I'm not that handy at this yet. And so I just kind of did this to give an idea of what might happen uh, with sea level rise and storms. And if you think about the Gulf Coast or the East Coast, when a hurricane comes down, it's, it's common to have storm surges of 10 feet or more. So um, it just gives an idea of um, here's the city. And one thing that's interesting is at the lower left, where it says near a lagoon, that's the sewage treatment plant. And that is critical infrastructure. So it's kind of like the joke about the two-headed alligator. Um, so there's another joke about the two-headed alligator. No. OK. Maybe I'll uh, well, the idea is he's got, it's, I guess it's a crocodile. He's got a crocodile's head on one side and an alligator's head on the other side. And he says, well, how does it go to bounty? He says, well, that's what makes him so mean. <laughs> so this is, this is critical infrastructure. And there are also obviously roads, the boardwalk, the boardwalk there is, I think, elevated. So it wouldn't necessarily get flooded, but um, the beach would, et cetera. So, um, and the light blue is 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 potential water. Yeah, the light blue is yes, underwater is it, basically. It's and it's it's kind of the San Lorenzo River, so it's okay. I don't think there's a real change there. Um there um okay, so why is sea level rising? Uh mainly two reasons. One is that when the ocean gets warmer, it expands thermal, just like air or water in a teapot. The other is that ice is melting. And um, this, I find, as a, as a fan of penguins and other Arctic creatures, I just find this heartbreaking because you watch, watch what's happening to their habitat and, and such, it's, uh, it, it's, it's heartbreaking. But um, I, I bring this in because um, this is why oceans are rising. Um, it's a global phenomenon. There's not much we can do about it locally except to prepare for it. Um, so this is, take this with a grain of salt. Um, this is the sea level elevation equivalent of the amount of ice that's stored on these uh, two large landmasses, about 60 meters in Antarctica and about seven in Greenland. 
and then a less than half in glaciers and ice caps elsewhere. But if all of this were to melt, sea level would rise by 215 feet. And I think we're at about 80 feet right mm -hmm. here. But that, that's a red herring because that's nobody's predicting that's going to happen anytime soon. But it just gives you a sense of the potential. Um, if and, you know, there, there are, There's a lot of work being done about what's happening underneath the ice sheets in Antarctica. Because if it melts there between the ice and the rock, it gets slippery. And big chunks can slide off. And if a big chunk slides off the land, it's just like it melted. And that might raise sea level quickly. Um, so anyway, this is just a global driver of the sea level rise that we see locally. And in California, sea level has gone up about eight inches, um, I think, uh, since about the year 2000, or uh, 1900. Um, this is interesting because in San Francisco and La Jolla, it's gone up eight inches, but it's you don't notice it in Crescent City because tectonically, that land area is rising at about the same speed, which is interesting. Um, we actually are on a place that's rising too. Ben Lomond is rising, and so maybe that'll keep us out of the water. From some subduction. Uh, well, yeah, from, you, yes, um, basically along the San Andreas Fault, the seafloor is going it's under us, down. and it's kind of... I mean, that's, I hope there aren't any geologists here that are <laughs> close to me on that definition. But, um, okay, and then, um, okay, so river flooding. So I, I mentioned excessive rain and this idea about the jet stream getting wavy and storms sitting in place for a longer period of time. I think in 1981, when the Love Creek disaster happened up in Boulder Creek, it rained 12 inches in 12 hours. So hopefully we won't see too much of that anymore, but um, that's because the storm just parked there. It just parked there for a day and it was an intense storm. Um, and this is Pajaro, town of Pajaro last spring. So the potential for damage is, is great. Okay, drought and wildfire, another local hazard. Um, this is a combined graph that indicates both the amount of precipitation that's falling and the amount of evaporation and evapotranspiration from plants that's happening. And so if you have higher temperatures and more evaporation, you basically have less water for, for forests and, and plant communities to um, stay healthy. So this is just a trend and you can see basically since uh, about 2005, um, which is my, 20, 2006 is my marker for when the sand bars started not shaping up very well for surf because it was a dry, that's when a long dry period started. But anyway, um, so it's been dry for the last 20 years, except for last year and uh, 2017 and maybe 2011. Yeah. Um, and hopefully we share. So this is 2018 near um, Shaver Lake in the foothills directly east from us. And that's what the forests were looking like in large swaths of the Sierra foothills. And then two years later, this is the creek fire near Shaver Lake. Wow. And it's just a horrendous thing. At the bottom there, you can kind of see a, a line against the uh, forest. I mean, it's just, and then of course the Dixie fire up uh, by Mount Lassen was even more intense. Uh, this is the Caldor fire in 2021. And you can see the, the path of the fire pretty much follows a smoke line from the lower left up. And then this is when it was burning intently uh, near South Lake Tahoe. Um, and if you have drive up Highway 50 now, you can see how much of that is visible. Um, and then of course, this is our CZU fire in 2020. So um, there's a number of reasons for this other than drought. Uh, you know, there's been fire suppression for a long time so that the fuels have built up and, and that sort of thing as well. But um, so the, the increased global temperature, the changes in weather patterns that cause drought are, are big factors in driving these hazards. Um, okay, and I, oops. I said I'd mention ocean acidification. Um, CO2 dissolves very easily in water. And about 30% of the CO2 that's gone up into the atmosphere has now dissolved into water. 
there was a little bit of buffering going on for a while. But um, now what's happening is CO2 is joining with H2O to form um, bicarbonate, um, yeah, bicarbonate ions, which are uh, negatively charged, meaning they lower, lower pH, they're more acidic. And so that's the basic chemical process that's happening in the ocean. And above that, you can see on the left some salmon swimming around. And the green shell is a pteropod, which is a swimming snail, little swimming snail. It's a huge food source for salmon. But they have fairly thin carbonate shells. And carbon, carbonate dissolves rapidly in acidic conditions. And so going from left to right, you can see that uh, the shells in, and then you have deformed dead animals. Um, these are tiny little things. They're probably uh, a centimeter across, I guess. Um, but the, you can see the quote at the bottom, perhaps. It, this is from an oyster farmer up in Olympia, Washington. He says, the seawater pumped into the hatchery is so corrosive that it eats away the young oyster shells before they can form. So oyster hatcheries are having a really hard time now producing um, spat to, to grow into adult oysters. The real trick about this, though, isn't pteropods and it isn't oysters. It's basically everything from tropical reefs to phytoplankton. Um, and if there's, it, you know, if there's a threat to life on Earth, it's tough to beat this one. And this is the silent part of climate change. Nobody talks about it. I mean, if we were a forward-thinking, rational society, this would be the hot topic in presidential debates, right? Because it's the future. Of the planet. But anyway, it's out there. And um, so I want to maybe say at this point that I used to tell my kids <laughs> that uh, being courageous is different than being fearless because um, <laughs> the joke up here. Because you can't be brave unless you're scared. So Sorry. Anyway, I'm scared. <laughs> and you all should be too. So it's a good time to be brave. So that's what we're going to do now. Uh, a comment while you're on this subject. Yeah. I've read that because of the bath of bath, bathing effects or the absorption effects of the oceans, it basically pulls the CO2 out of it mm -hmm. so well. That might be a targeted treatment. Um, item where they actually go to the oceans and pull the CO2 out of there rather than trying to pull it out of the air. Have you heard? Enhanced alkalization. You know, out, yeah, pull it yeah. Out. So you got a repository, it's sucking it out. So let's use the oceans as our second phase of pulling out the CO2. Yeah, okay. So it's a big beaker to titrate, you know. <laughs> but um, there was, uh, I, when I was a grad student at Moss Landing Marine Labs in the 80s, the director of the lab was John Martin. And he had the nickname the Iron Man because he studied trace metals in the marine environment. And he realized because they made a huge advancement in the, their ability to detect trace metals in the environment, that the ocean was basically um, starved of iron. And if there were more iron, more phytoplankton would grow. Phytoplankton are plants, and they take in CO2 and they release oxygen. And they actually, in the late 80s, got a very large scale experiment funded where they went out on a freighter with um, just industrial sized piles of iron and kind of dissolved the iron and, and sprinkled it out over, the, over a trail of the ocean. And then they measured it very carefully. And it worked. There were huge blooms of phytoplankton. And John Martin was quoted one time saying, um, Give me enough iron and I'll give you an ice age. And so um, there was a lot of enthusiasm around that, but he also predicted, and this is what came to pass, is that if you have big phytoplankton blooms, they're followed by big zooplankton blooms because those little animals can reproduce really quickly. Mm -hmm. And so that's what happened. There was an initial phytoplankton bloom. The amount of CO2 and oxygen changed in the water column but it was followed by animals eating it and giving off CO2. <laughs> so the, the good part of it is that some of that CO2 stayed in those zooplankton when they died and settled to the bottom. 
So it got some carbon down to the bottom, but that's about as close as I've seen to something like that. You know, did, did you read about the one in Alaska? No, there was a, a tribe in Alaska that hired some outfit to do the same thing. Uh, anyway. Look, yeah. It's easy okay. To Google okay. And read up on it. I will take the phone. Yeah. It actually, it actually became kind of a um, entrepreneurial thing after they did the experiment because it looked like the government was going to fund a lot of these studies, and so a lot of people came along with boats and said, "Hey, um, hire me. I can do this." And that might be what's going on up there. So, yeah. did I see a question? Yeah. So, um, in two thousand nine, I took a team to the Monterey Bay Planning Research Institute, and we did they shared this research specifically. Um, it ultimately led me to exit the fish oil marketplace and start working on algae tech solutions uh, to replace some of the in that arena. Mm -hmm. But this scared the crap out of me then. Yeah. And their prediction was that our ocean could get to the point where it no longer supports life on Earth, you know, within 50 years yeah. if we don't correct things. Yeah. So do you know where we are in that? realm now, given that it's been 14 years? Um, I don't know the 14 year um, change, but in general, the ocean, since the start of the Industrial Revolution, has gotten about 30% more acidic. So it's, and that's, that's the, the pH scale is logarithmic. So that's only, I think, 0.1 or 0.2 pH. So it sounds small, but it's actually a 30% yeah, increase in acidic. Yeah. So, um, I mean, really, you know, what's going on, all the other, other hazards I was mentioning, you know, it's a big deal, we got to deal with them, but, you know, this is kind of a silent killer here that we need to keep in, uh, in mind. So. Well, we're already seeing now what, in Florida, there was flesh-eating bacteria that's starting to bloom out because mm -hmm. there's temperature change there, yeah. too, and so it's creating friendly environments for these bacteria to thrive. Yeah. And that's, you know, yeah, it's really far from Santa Cruz County, uh, but the oceans are all connected. Yeah. Like, well, we there's, a, there's also a whole other thing about on land, about... Um, a lot of disease vector insects and such thrive in warmer temperatures, you know, like, um, yeah. you know, mosquitoes that kills. Anyway, yeah. so, okay, so I think we've hit the bottom here. So I want to try and kind of dig, us, dig ourselves out a little bit. Um, and so here's one definition of risk. is the probability that a hazard will cause damage. So you've got a, a big tree limb up above you you're walking under it, if that tree limb falls, it's gonna hit me and head cause damage. What's the probability that it's gonna fall? And you can find that out by seeing, well, is it weak? Is it, you know, this and that. But um, our job is to reduce the risk of climate impacts. That's one of our jobs. The other one is for the next talk, which is reducing our carbon emissions. But, um, so I wanna talk about a bunch of projects that um, are, are have been planned and are ready to be implemented. And I'm actually working on a, a team that's writing a large grant proposal to try and get them funded. Um, they're not my project, so I don't get funded by them, but I think they're worthwhile. So I'm going to go through those because it gives you an idea of adaptation actions that people are taking now or will be taking when funding comes along. And I'll give you a, um, uh, what do you call it when you give away the end of the story? Um, Anyway, I'm going to get to the end of the story. They, um, a spoiler? A spoiler. A little spoiler here. The, the, this, we're trying to get $75 million to fund these projects. I've never worked on a grant so large, but um, that's about if maybe three houses in Pebble Beach fell into the ocean. It's, you know, it's, it's kind of that, yeah. that amount of money. So it, there's different ways of thinking. Um, okay, so the grant that we're writing, and I think a lot of people would agree with this, is looking for nature-based solutions. They don't want concrete being poured, um, at least not entirely. And our theme for this is accommodation space, where water, floodwaters can go um, so that they don't end up on city streets and other places where they cause damage. And to have accommodation space, you can't just have a big pond it has to be something like a fun well functioning wetland. And that's a whole nother topic. But um, so accommodation space is a, is a major theme. Um, and then living shorelines, which is a process of taking cobble and wood and sand and planting it with hardy plants and putting it um, where it can help extend the beach. And I personally think this will work. But I think it's along our coast, it's a tough 
thing to do because the wave energy is so great and the beaches are so narrow. But there are some places that have been identified for this, including Rio del Mar, actually, not right in front of where it flooded, but um, I think closer to uh, to the west out up by um, Seaport State Beach. Um, and I'll show you some, some locations in some of these projects. And then forest management and fuel reduction to deal with the drought, wildfire impacts, threats. Um, and then working with the colleges and universities and others to get a climate ready workforce in place. So we've got people moving forward with new ideas and new skills to improve things. And finally, um, to get people working together through some formal networks and collaboratives. Everybody always says, you know, don't end up in a silo, work together and everything, but coordination is incredibly time consuming. And so it, it, it takes a lot of organization to make that efficient. Um, and so this is the program is the NOAA Coastal Resilience Regional Challenge. Um, we put in a letter of intent last August and they received 850 because $75 million grants don't come around very often. So it's very competitive. Out of those 850, they whittled it down to about 120. And we got asked to submit a full proposal. And I think they're going to find about 40. So it's very competitive. We're competing probably against Manhattan and Miami. And I know there's a really strong proposal from San Francisco Bay and also from Southern California. But I think we've got to get there. So we'll see. So that, is it a challenge proposal that we're seeing? Is it like the whole county? It's, it's um, I'll, I'll actually show you a list of all the people. It's both counties, four cities, uh, uh, resource conservation districts, various agencies. Um, yeah, I've, I've got a list. Um, and the plan is already drafted. The, the, the plan for the individual projects have all been drafted and vetted and approved and all that. They just need to be funded. Um, so one of the you know groups of people we're working with are um, the Ohlone. And um, there's a federation of Ohlone people that tries to you know coordinate tribal um, advice to this and also to look out for tribal um, interests. And um, there's a, a woman that we've been working with and she she included this in an email to me. This is how do we live with change rather than put our human needs at the center of the solution. Mm -hmm. And that's a tough one because our proposal is to protect vulnerable communities like the Beach Flats in Watsonville and Pajaro and Casterville. Um, but I keep this in mind, and I think it'll, it'll come up and make some sense later on, too. But there are definitely different ways of looking at this. Um, OK, so I, I said that the projects had to be in plans. or it, That's one of the requirements of the grant. I'm not sure I said that. But they have to be in existing plans, so they've been approved by some authority. And these are some of the plans that are, are out there that have been um, put together and, in some cases, updated. And you'll see a lot of them have climate action and adaptation in them. The, 19, or the, the 2016 plan from the city of Monterey is just called the Climate Action Plan. And I don't think they had too much of a focus on adaptation. None, none of these jurisdictions did at that time. But everybody's kind of saying, OK, our old plans were, how do we decrease the amount of carbon we're putting in the atmosphere? And that's great. But everybody's starting to say, OK, the climate's a very large ship that turns very slowly we've got to get ready for what we know is coming. So adaptation is taking center stage, um, or at least equal stage with mitigation. Yes. Is part of the those plans include condemning areas no. that are being used, <laughs> that are too low to be used? Yeah, um, no. <laughs> um, <laughs> they shouldn't. Yeah, I mean, like, I think one of the better examples of that was New Orleans after, what was it, Katrina? I can't remember. Yeah. Um, there were whole neighborhoods that were unsuitable to build yeah. back in. And so the city came out and said, you can't build back in this neighborhood. And it, they just got a ton of political pushback because it's like, this is our neighborhood. We live here. We're going to we're going to move back in. Get a vote. So, I mean, yeah, it's a it's a very tricky thing to tell someone they can't they have to leave or or, or they can't rebuild or they can't live there in the first place. But um, luckily, we don't have to deal with that because we've got other options. Are you studying the tax benefits? That, uh, that could be enacted by local governments to encourage various types of structure? Yes, um, I'm not studying it, but I am aware of it. Um, 
I, that maybe that'll pop something useful will pop into my head in a few minutes, but um, that is a thing. Yeah, what um, is it? just the tax benefits of relocating, mm -hmm. yeah. and it it is a thing out there. Sure. So maybe some of you know about it, but I I can't remember the details right now. Well, yeah, I mean, yeah. So again, I mean, you know, there there are many facets that attach to climate change, including political and economic and everything, and and. You could have series after series here, you know, kind of going off in this direction. I'm not that good at it. So. I know that there's a group of some hospital in Texas, I think it was, where they're now training doctors to prepare for climate change and the mm -hmm. issues that will come on the, you know, the health, that, especially emergency room doctors. Yeah. Where people are coming in affected by climate Heat change. And such. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so that's a no whole new <laughs> aspect of it. Um, okay, so this is these are just a few clips from that um, table of contents from the Santa Cruz Climate Action Adaptation Plan. Um, the acknowledgement that climate change is here now. There's a large equity component because everybody realizes that certain communities are going to get disproportionately impacted. Um, there's greenhouse gas emission targets to try and get put less in the atmosphere, and then there's there are a number of prioritized mitigation and adaptation projects in this plan. Most of the other plans are similar where there's a number of projects that have been put in competitively and vetted through the process. And they say, we think this one's good. You know, if we have funding, we'll fund, fund it. Um, okay, so now I wanna, wanna start showing what these projects are and where they're located. Um, so this is, uh, Monterey Bay with seven feet of sea level rise. And you can see the center part of the bay from the Pajaro River mouth down to the Salinas River mouth has a lot of potential inundation, especially of farmland and also places like Pajaro and Pastureville. Um, so this is a draft map, um, but it shows it shows where our projects are gonna be. And counterintuitively, the fire projects are blue and the water projects are red. <laughs> so that was my first comment on this draft. Um, so um, up in Santa Cruz, there are uh, two projects along the San Lorenzo River. One is the bench lands behind the county building that you know had a homeless camp for a long time. That floods. And the, the idea is, OK, we know it floods. If we, if we restore it correctly as a ephemeral wetland, that can hold flood water and keep it from going down to the beach flats. And that's one of these ideas is to hold water upstream or wherever to keep it from going somewhere where it's going to cause a problem. Also, the Jesse Street Marsh just downstream of that is a similar situation. And then the lower red dot is actually a living shoreline dune restoration project by the boardwalk. And I don't have much, I don't have a lot of detail on the living shorelines because. The contractor is in charge of that project is in Baja and has been out of communication for two weeks and driving me crazy. But <laughs> um, water. Yeah, we need to we need his budget narrative to put this together. So um are you but, gonna are you gonna touch on the on the keeping floodwaters so they won't uh, you know go where they'll cause damage? Is that you're gonna touch on yeah, that, yeah. That off? generally, yeah. I mean that was that's kind of the idea of those bench lands on along the San Lorenzo by the county building. But I mean all across Santa Cruz, I don't see uh, any attention to run. It's all just uh, not in my backyard. Yet. Yeah. Um, and it's huge. Well, um, a few years ago, I worked on a stormwater resource plan for Monterey County, and that was all about that. It was about trying to increase infiltration where the water lands, trying to have wetlands to capture it before it goes downstream. There's, there is a lot of that going on. A lot of projects planned, some of them being actually built. But um, yeah, that's a big deal. But we're kind of looking at the big river systems and our focus is like right along the coast. Because this is NOAA and NOAA has ocean as one of its uh, letters in the acronym. Um, <laughs> So um, there's the red dot at Rio del Mar for a, a, a living shoreline dune restoration project. Um, the red dot up Pajaro River is kind of an extension on the massive um, levee setback project that the Army Corps of Engineers is doing. That's a $600 million project that's being 
done by the Pajaro Regional Flood Management Agency. And the Pajaro Regional Flood Management Agency is also proposing the red dot picture, which is at the South Sequoia's Creek confluence with Pajaro River. And it's a really important place to create some combination space because that Bridge Street neighborhood floods is very flood prone. Well, I'm just curious what this type of a plan actually entails. Is it you know, grading, planting of grasses, beavers. Yeah, beavers. yeah, beavers. Beavers are great, actually. They really are. Um, They're reintroducing beavers up north, I know. Yeah, yeah. Um, so it, I'll, I'll show you a couple. Um, I think maybe it's the next slide. Um, oh, well, here's here are the people that are involved in this. I'll, I'll give you a second to look at it. It's quite a group. And um, all of them owe us um, some information to help us get the proposal. <laughs> Um, are they all contributors too? Or is um, they're all recipients of funding if this gets funded. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, these, they all have projects that would like to get funded in this proposal. So that's there's the $75 million. Um, so, um, no, no. No. What's the optimum amount of money? If you have your wish, what would it be? Um, well, I would say for these projects, um, it's close. It's probably maybe you know 15 million more or something you've got to, to, to do some right. of the kind of add-ons that are important. Um, but to really tackle everything that's going on, I mean, I think just rebuilding the staircase at Manresa Uplands costs close to a million dollars. You know that was damaged in 2017. So I mean, it's 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 certainly expensive, but it's again, it's kind of an outset prevention um, type of thing because spending the money now saves so much money down the road. Um, on, so the aptos one where you want to put the is is that protecting those fancy houses? Is it's not protecting the fancy houses, and it's not it's protecting right. the real flats. And this is very interesting because the Rio Flats, and I this is something I don't know about. So if someone knows, I bet someone knows this yeah. better than I do. But there was a bond measure uh, a couple of years ago to fund uh, storm improvements, and it was defeated. So um, no one lives there except. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so state parks is is looking for money to it, and it's basically to kind of. Begin with the protecting the access of Seacliff Beach State Park, but it's also for habitat. And early on in discussions, I said, "Okay, this is great. So your your goal is to protect the the Beach Flats neighborhood because they didn't even vote for the bond thing. I don't care about this guy. So I'm trying to build the dune restaurants. I'm 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 exaggerating. He was a little more um, circumspect than that, but um, but that's a problem for us because our goal is to protect low lying areas." And so um, they all when you get when you get a group like this that all have projects that they worked hard to frame up, and then you try to get them to put it into a proposal that says this is what the proposal is supposed to be for. All of them need to tweak it a little bit away from their cherished goals. <laughs> and some are more flexible on doing that than others. And so <laughs> luckily we've got the red pen at the end. But um, anyway, okay. Um, Okay, so these are the um, the flooding projects. Um, so there, um, I'll show you a couple brief pictures of them. Um, the San Lorenzo River we talked about, Lower Watsonville Slough, and that's basically taking farmland that frequently floods and turning it into a wetland to protect the farmland and eventually Watsonville behind it. Um, I mentioned the Cajaro uh, Sosquitas Confluence. The Salinas River has the same thing with Pastorville. There needs to be some restoration of the Salinas River mouth and the old Salinas River. Um, Elkhorn Slough National Estuary and Reserve has a marsh uh, restoration project. Um, State beaches. And the Carmel River, this is the Big Sur Land Trust. Um, Carmel River often floods. Um, it's hard for us to, to designate them as a disadvantaged community, there. but um, the, 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 it's a big project and this is contributing to it. Um, so Santa Cruz County is the one that's dealing with the Rio Del Mar one. That it's state yeah. parks. It's what? State parks is oh, doing okay. the, the, okay. the dune restoration. 
So here's an example of one of the projects. This is the one I just mentioned about. Um, so this is behind. These are the. This is the Pajara Dunes community, um, which is heavily riprap. You have to go up on the third floor of most of these to see the ocean because there's a yeah. huge pile of rock in front. And then, of course, they've got the Pajaro River coming down right behind them, and they're on the city sand spit. But um, that's all hard armoring, which is not the nature-based solution that this that the project is supposed to fund. Um, but it's the, worked so far. Um, yeah, they had to be evacuated um, a, a week or so ago. Yeah. But yeah. I mean, yeah, and in general, I mean, it's all kind of sinking. I, I don't know. Um, I, yeah, I'm not. I'm not the expert on that one. But um, the green in front is the ocean. The green behind the the dunes houses is Watsonville Slough that comes down to the lower left and then goes inland up towards Watsonville, um, which is one path for floodwaters to get to Watsonville. But the um, uh, stippled areas, especially the yellow one, um, actually the yellow one in the lower left is a project by Santa Cruz County for that Watsonville Slough area. And the one, the yellow stipples along the Watsonville Slough going out to the right is the land trust of Santa Cruz. And they have a willing seller whose farmland floods every year with salt water. Um, and so th there's restoration there to protect the farmland behind it and eventually protect Watsonville. So that's the type of thing is those things will be graded and planted um, to be restored wetland habitat to function as a, as a barrier and accommodation space to protect what's behind it. And to, and to accommodate more water. And, and to yeah, allow more water so it doesn't go elsewhere. And what's the red? The red is um, a, an extension of the project, I think, that's not going to be funded in this grant. And the thin red lines that kind of go out in a V to the right is a planning area for more projects. Um, these are the fire projects, um, and most of them have to do with prescribed burn. Some of them are um, rangeland grazing to cut down grass and, and uh, woody debris that would otherwise threaten oaks and such like that. And it's great because one of the um, in one of the budgets that was submitted by I think the Santa Lucia uh, restoration group um, had dog food in the supplies for the budget, and it's because they have um, cattle herding dogs, and so. <laughs> We had to send a question to Washington, D.C. and say, will you fund dog food? <laughs> and they said, sure. You know, just, I mean, it's like gas for a car. So um, anyway, so um, these projects is one up in uh, San Vicente Creek up north of Santa Cruz. Um, the Nicene Marks one has fallen out. They found another funding source for it um, or are looking for another one. Some of these are around Elkhorn Slough, and many are in the San Lucia Mountains behind um, Monterey. And this is a picture I took um, a couple of weeks ago on a bike ride. This is a prescribed burn on Mount Madonna. And I didn't know it was happening, but when I got there, um, I knew it was, and I checked with them. And so this is the type of thing. And one, one really important aspect of this is that um, the indigenous people who lived here before were really um, adept at using fire to grow the plants that they used. Mm -hmm and to reduce um, fire hazards for, you know, crown, crown fires, et cetera. And the Esalen tribe and hopefully the Amamutsun are involved in this as part of the team that does prescribe burns. And it's, um, they call it cultural burning. It's not that many areas of acreage, but they will be involved with the larger prescribed burns as well. Um, but it's to, it's to grow traditional plants and um, allow them to do traditional things. Is this just mm -hmm. taking the understory when they do that, or um, yeah, it, you know, I I'm not that good at that when at this one they're especially, but yeah, it basically it is taking the understory, you know, invasive plants and just fuel that would would reach up into the canopy. There was a show I just went to it yesterday at the DM, and it's all about the Costa Nona. Mm -hmm. They're all down here, and everybody spoke, and all. it was really informative. Mm -hmm. I mean, I would love to get that presentation or that show down here for all of that. That would be great. It was, it was very good. People speaking and, you know, explaining this about yeah. the learnings and, and what they're doing in each area. Yeah, I mean, they're, they're, they're traditionally, they're very good at this. And a lot of that has been preserved through generations. And we're, you know, um, really want to 
bring that into this prescribed burnout. It is being done that way, but um, I think this is a good um, boost. Um, I mentioned workforce development, and these are the partners in the workforce development part. Watsonville Wetlands Watch is great. They have internship programs and field training for high school students, and then they have an academy um, for older students, in, you know, 18 to 24, I think. And right now that academy is focused on urban forestry, planting trees in the city of Watsonville. Mm -hmm. But if we get this grant, they're gonna either transform that or create yeah. another academy for climate adaptation. So they're great. And so they feed into Hartnell College and CSUMB. Actually, it's kind of, kind of feeds this way. Hart Watsonville Wetlands Watch from the teenagers into Hartnell College for two years into CSUMB and then UC Santa Cruz for grad school. And that's kind of where the emphasis is on this. Um, and then there is um, a paid, the internships are paid. Um, there's job placement involved and strong recruiting from Watsonville and other disadvantaged communities. Um, I think this is really neat. Um, and this is just a picture of um, some technical training out in the field. Um, I, this is not us. I, I just grabbed this picture because one of the things Hartnell is proposing is a drone piloting class. Because drones are really useful for restoration stuff. And I think that's what this is here. Um, and the last thing I'll touch on is this idea of working together. And the idea here is for the California Marine Sanctuary Foundation to convene an ongoing uh, climate adaptation action network. And the, the members of that network are listed below, plus others. And you can see that some of them already have the word collaborative in them or working group or committee. So there's a lot of collaboration already going on. Most of it's focused towards mitigation, towards reducing carbon um, emissions. But the idea of this is to get everybody on the same page working towards adaptation projects. And getting future adaptation projects funded because one of the main goals of this grant program is to um, build capacity into the future. So the workforce development and this it has a lot to do with, with building capacity. Is that climate adaptation network, is that, that like the main clearinghouse or point? Yeah, that's where all these people come together. And where you can contact the appropriate ones through that. Uh, yeah, I mean, for instance, the, the climate, the uh, modern day climate justice collaborative is about 15 or 20 community based organizations that are basically frontline organizations that work with people in all sorts of, um, you know, socially disadvantaged situations and but they have climate aspects to them and so they're all coming together in the climate justice collaborative and then the climate justice collaborative is coming together and within the network, that sort of thing. Okay, I think that's my last slide. And this is just a um, photograph of people, um, mainly um, volunteers or trainees uh, or interns out in the field um, working on nature based solutions. And it's um, to me, it's a really positive image. I mean, these kids are out there doing it, and it means something. So. Okay, more questions. Okay. What about oh. acidification? Well, going back to acidification, oh, yeah. uh, are there any other ideas other than the rust? Yeah. In, in um, I'm sure there are. I don't know what they are. Um, someone mentioned Mabari. Um, they're, they're on Jim Barry at, at Mimari is a world expert on this and but I don't um I, I don't know. I, I would I'd say uh, certainly people are proposing things. I just don't know where they are. This is for the people online so they can hear your questions. It's not to magnify your voice in-house, so you'll still need to speak up loud enough for people here to hear you. But this, if you could speak into this, ask your question into this and then the online people can hear you. Okay, I thought you were going to give that to Cindy for a second. <laughs> you don't want to do that. <laughs> so, so I got a rhythmic question for you. So if, if the rate of rise that we're seeing now, when will the mean tide tide right up here on the cliffs be um, coming up to the cliff? Yeah. Um, 
So it's funny because um, sea level rise on the West Coast kind of stalled for a while. Um, I think from about the year 2000 or even earlier than that, up until about 2015. And then it picked up again. And a lot of that is because of the atmospheric circulation and the trade winds. And when the trade winds are strong, they tend to push a lot of ocean water over to the Western Pacific and Indonesia and the Philippines and all that. And they've had a lot of, you know, the uh, Micronesia and some of those islands have been flooded. Um, but now in this kind of El Nino circulation pattern, it weakens and the water sloshes back. So anyway, we're seeing right for the last eight years, I think we've been seeing one centimeter per year. So it's, I mean, in a geologic time scale, that's absurdly fast. In our lifetime, you know, that's an inch every two and a half years. Um, so, um, but I bet the storms are going to drive that more than it's, I mean, on a, on a calm day at high tide with water just sitting at the cliff, I don't know, that could be a couple of decades or, you know, you know. Um, the thing about it though is the, we're, this is sand. There's no bedrock there. No. And so when the, when the waves, you know, hit the bottom of the cliff and undercut it, you know, cliffs collapse. And I'm, to, to tell you the truth, I'm frankly amazed that we haven't lost the rail line. Yes. Uh, it's a microphone behind you. Man. Yeah, the microphone. Uh, uh, so it sounds like the measurement of the ocean rising is one thing that one centimeter here. What sounds more important, though, is the level of the waves consistency. How much have they risen? And I would suspect it's more than one centimeter. Is there any metrics or analysis mm -hmm. being done on that? You know what I'm saying? And yeah, yeah. How, like how average annual rate. Right, because the waves are going to be bigger surge. Yeah, time. yeah. That's what I hear is the big problem. Yeah, that's interesting. Um, I mean, you could probably get Surfline to go back and do something with that. Maybe they have. Um, Noah probably has too. I don't know. That's a really good question. I, I'll look for that. Surfriders? Surfline, it's surf, a, which is a wave yeah, forecasting. Yeah, but, but, but surf oh, well, surfline. Yeah, maybe. Um, they've had a real water quality emphasis, but um, yeah, that's it. That's that's that'd be really neat to see the trend. I, I'm sure. It's, I'm sure it's somewhere. Um, yes. Do you encourage the planting of ice plant? No. <laughs> what, what's the reason that you you discourage the the idea of planting all that ice plant? Um, ice plant is. Um, isn't very well rooted. It just spreads out across. And so temporarily, well, um, where was it? I think it was up at um, Waddell Creek last year where the waves had washed up. There were huge layers of ice plant that had grown out that had just been flipped back Are by the waves. Eradic eradication programs. There, was, I know State Parks was doing it in, Mo in Southern Monterey Bay. And it's really kind of cool what they did. They would just take it and turn it upside down. And then they would punch holes in it and plant plants in it. And as the ice plant died, it would provide nutrition for the native plants. That oh. So anyway. On that same subject, um, does it temporarily uh, keep the rain and, and the water from washing away the sand? I know it, I know it changes the, the, the... Ice plant? Yeah. Yeah. Um, again, it's not very well rooted and it's heavy. So, so what's, just put, what's what's the, the 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 natural plants? Are they any better when the water's pounding on them? Yeah, they are because they're more deep rooted and they okay. hang in there more. The yeah. other thing that I've seen is wildfires. I, I, my house was twenty five feet away from a wildfire, and ice plant is fireproof, isn't it? Um, I think it's probably it would probably be a good barrier. Yeah. So I mean, so yeah. is would it be okay? Maybe not on dunes, but on in 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 on your roof. <laughs> I, I don't know. I don't know what the, you know, the fire is. It's just a thought because because yeah. where yeah. I live, the wildfires are, are frequent and, and, yeah. and devastating and uh, it burns everything. Yeah. If, 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 I don't know if it grows though, very well outside of the coastal area. No, and that, that might be. I, I've got a friend that lives up by UCSC and he it it's just above Hoganip and there's camps down there that have fires frequently and he's really worried about the fire going up the hill but he's he's got oaks there but he's also got ivy which i can't stand ivy, you know well, but but i was so thinking well that might that might be okay for it too. yeah i guess so I, so i don't know, I don't know. That's not... <laughs>
Yes. Um, I mean, statement, yeah, okay. The question was if when you're doing dune restoration, um, do you have plants that are stable that will help help hold the dunes in place? And yeah, my understanding of this, and I'm just learning about it from scratch now, is that you get cobbles and wood and cover it with sand and put the right kind of plants on it. And the surf can, can go up there and and it's less disturbed than most other types of things. I'm actually skeptical just because, as I said, the, um, the, the energy of the ocean and the, and the width of the beach is a tough, tough challenge, but you kind of have to experiment with it and see if it works. And I, it has worked, like you said, um, down in near the Salinas River and stuff. It, it has worked pretty well. Yeah. <laughs> With um, the coming back, are they going to change like the layers on our area, whether the day camps, like, or is there plans? It seems like a waste of money resources. Like, they clean it all up, they get all beautiful, and then you walk down the right now, and you're like, wow, all that work they did is gone. Yeah. <laughs> are they going to change the way that's done right now? I don't know. Solution? Um, I, my guess is, you know, this, if someone wanted to do a major remodel of a house in Rio del Mar, they'd probably have to put it on stilts. Yeah. Um, yeah. And then, um, but yeah, the um, the most striking example of what you're talking about was um, when the big swell hit a week ago or so, the 28th, I guess, um, out on the um, Capitola Wharf was a big pile driving machine sitting there <laughs> at basically the wharf seems to be at about the same elevation it was before. And you're seeing these big waves come up hitting the pile driving machine that's oh. doing the repair oh my god you know so and and then of course seacliff beach you know there was a lot of repair back in 1982 and it lasted for 40 years but then it got blown out last year and yeah so that's tough um, friends adopt it <laughs> <laughs> anything else Oh yeah, we do. Um, well, I, yeah, I don't want to wait. But I, I have a, a group on next door. If I really want to continue the conversation, you can scan this or just mm -hmm. search for climate on the next door groups if you're on next door. But uh, I took the possibly foolish step of creating a group a while back. We got about 42 people now. Okay, good. You know, the the thing I want to mention, which I mentioned earlier, is that the next talk a month from now is going to have a lot more about what you can do individually. This is more like what's happening by organization. What is your group? It's called Climate Chaos. So if you just search for climate, you find it. Well, I'm going to join that next door group. Um, I have a podcast called Care More, Be Better, which is all about social impact, sustainability, and regenerative solutions. Okay. I would first off love to invite you to come on the show, and maybe we could even do a little series to educate a broader audience. Okay. Um, and then I just would really like to understand if we're going to be um, here again in about a month's time, what the plan for that talk is, so that I can even perhaps position the audience better. To be ready for that. Um, Sandy, could you hit the home button? Maybe it'll go to that first slide. And then, oh, to the or something to the very first slide. Do you have the? Okay. Um, uh, just click yeah. it. Okay. So, um, <laughs> yeah, the the next talk is more about reducing carbon emissions. Um. Also about atmospheric engineering. We were talking about titrating the ocean earlier. This would be about how you're trying to do something with the atmosphere. Um, and I'll, I'll give you a, something I was going to mention in that talk is that um, there's a book that was picked as the book for kind of the University of California Santa Cruz population to read. So they all have something to talk about. And it's called Under a White Sky. And it is a fascinating book about humans trying to undo the damage that was done by things humans did to prevent damage before. <laughs> so like a classic example is humans introduced silver carp to the 
Mississippi. And it's an invasive species that then really did some damage to local species. And so that was an intervention. And now they're kind of coming up with an intervention to keep that from getting even more out of hand. And they're doing things like electrifying stretches of streams oh. to keep. And, and so it, it goes on and on about efforts to save endangered species. But when it comes down to um, climate change, which is the last chapter, it talks a bit about some of the things, some of the huge technically advanced mega expensive things like putting reflective tiny particles up in the atmosphere to have sun. And um, so this is a, another spoiler alert, but um, the reason the book's titled um, Under White Sky is that if they do that, the sky will no longer be blue. And it might be, you know, preserving the planet might, that might be a trade off, but you know, these things are like um, insidious. And um, I went to a, a workshop at UC Santa Cruz about 10 years ago with engineers proposing climate solutions like that. And every single one of them said, this might work. It's going to be incredibly expensive. And we know exactly what to do right now. Just quit putting carbon in the atmosphere. So let's just do that. Every single one of them said that. So I'm going to touch on that briefly, but um, now you don't need to need to hear that because I just told you everything I know about it. <laughs> um, reducing emissions personally and um, just as a society, uh, other personal actions, and then just this idea of building a better future, which um, I have some thoughts on that, but I, I, I can't tell you what they are now. <laughs> anyway, that's that's the that's a shorthand table of contents. Yeah. I, I just heard on NPR about um, GMC has just brought out a newer SUV. It's like 800, I don't know how many pounds, but it's bigger and heavier. And they're talking about how you know, the SUVs actually were able to be put under trucks, so the emissions is lower. But the the uh, carbon that's torn up by the car, because they're so heavy, mm -hmm. and of yeah. course, the pedestrian bike deaths are higher, because mm -hmm. SUVs, you can't see over them. But mm -hmm. in Washington, D.C., they've done this thing where now, and I, yesterday, I tried to park at De Young, and the SUVs were just completely taking mm -hmm. over double lanes. And so you couldn't park there, which was mind blowing. Yeah. But in, in Washington, D.C., they're starting to kick back where uh, anybody with these SUVs, they have to pay seven times the car registration yeah. for it. Yeah. And it's like, oh, I mean, we've mm -hmm. got to look at this. Like, it, Well, it's nice to incorporate real costs into the actual costs, you know, from these. Um, but do we need SUVs? One thing, one thing I love about SUVs is the branding because they all have names of places that are being destroyed by climate change. Right? There's, there's Denali, there's the Yukon, there's Tahoe, there's they all have names like that. So anyway, no. or by the way, just I'm sorry, someone's got a. Oh yeah. Yeah, that's a great question because you've touched on like four different areas yeah. of activities that people can do. And we in mentioned state. earlier, what's that? In your state. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. So the idea is in a low-lying place like Rio Del Mar, um, what's the best solution? Do you have like porous concrete and stormwater um, okay. solutions? Do you have um, seawalls or dunes to keep the ocean out? Um, do you uh, make people stilt or change their houses? Do you make people move away? Um, and I'll just say it's kind of all of the above. Um, I know that, um, like for instance, the Santa, the Community Foundation of Santa Cruz County is in that watershed and they're up across from Safeway and their parking lot is permeable pavement. And we actually, we actually have um, 
gravel in front of our house, which I like because the water percolates through it, but it's kind of a pain to manage. And so I looked into getting permeable pavement for that. And if you just do a small project, it's super expensive. But um, so that might be something where if you get a whole bunch of people together, the paving company will, it'll be worth their while to use a different system and do that. But but so anyway, permeable pavement, also um, other things like swales, which are little di mm -hmm. vegetated ditches that the stormwater can go into and percolate into the ground. It's like those stormwater things are um, spread the water, infiltrate, you know, retain it up in the watershed before it comes down. All this stuff's really important. Um, of course, you've got Aptos Creek there, which is a very big watershed, so it's kind of hard to hold that back. And then, um, yeah, whatever you can do to keep the, the waves out. But then, you know, if that stuff doesn't work, you know, at, at some point, people are going to st start having to think about living somewhere else or doing something with their house. Um, um, Sorry. I just want to give a shout out to Wetlands Watson in the city of Washington because yeah. they're doing a whole canopy project and mm -hmm. through all the city where uh, in the sidewalks where there's the little holes where, where trees used to be, there's a whole project and they're including school districts and churches mm -hmm. and the whole community. They're doing art projects, everything, and they're going to be replanting trees to just create this whole canopy. So yeah. I think they're doing some really cutting. I watched him roll some bunch. It's amazing. They've evolved into something. Oh, I think he was next. Yeah. Uh, One thing that I haven't heard and I, I thought about on, on the Rio Del Mar dilemma because the houses are, yet, you know, their access is at risk. An elevated roadway with big pilings like the rest of the you know the thoughts, and just forget about the kind of motion. Let me go under the uh, under the roadway. So it's still the roads and still the houses. Yeah. yeah. It's an <laughs> yeah. Well, no, I, I mean, I mean, sure. What yeah. do you do in Thailand? I mean, people are yeah. on stage. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, it's true. It's true. Thanks. The Venetian Road will be sort of reborn as a yeah, yeah, right. So, Venice, Venice. So, yeah. So uh, I've always had an hypothesis, hypothesis of with the oceans increasing in temperature, Aptos could get more foggy in the summer. Think about it, um, because it could go the other way. It could, it could go the other way, but it's a, you know, it's a, a, a throw, throw it out there as an observation. Um, yeah. You know, keep alert that we may get more fog because our oceans and it builds up just yeah, it's true. The, the last time I, I read anything, you know, scientific about this was probably 20 years ago, but they were saying that things look good for the redwoods because it looks like the fog will keep coming in because it'll get warmer inland and they'll draw it. So, but I, I haven't checked up on that really, but yeah, fog, fog's hard to predict. Um, and Fukushima. I, yeah. <laughs> um, I just want to mention that we did reschedule the one on the 20th. It is uh, now going to be in February on the 24th, mm -hmm. thanks to Noah and the grant. <laughs> but that's important. So we're 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 good with that because that's important. Um, and at 11 o'clock here. And 11 o'clock here, and then also online. And we'll um, the online version will be posted to the library's YouTube channel. So you can always listen to it if you if you missed any slides or wanted to get pictures of the group. I, you really clarified a lot of things for me. I don't know if other people feel that way, but I really, I really like yeah. it. Yeah. So thank you. Yeah, thank you very much for coming. Thank you, Sandy. No, no problem. <laughs> Yeah. All right. Yeah. I'll just stand here and hold it. If anybody wants to join that service. It was um, it's probably been kind of It was the time of my case. Talking about being ready. Not so much that, just the one this terrible.